Hello, everyone. I'm John Dickerson in Miami. Welcome to CBS News Primetime. History happened in the courthouse behind me Tuesday afternoon when Donald Trump became the first former president to be arraigned on federal charges. He pleaded not guilty to the 37 criminal counts against him. The Justice Department special counsel Jack Smith indicted Trump last week, accusing him of willfully retaining classified materials from his time as president and then hiding them from the federal government. After his court appearance in Miami, Trump flew to his Bedminster Golf Club in New Jersey, the same place he is alleged to have showed off some of those classified documents. He spoke to supporters at the lavish fundraiser as he pushed forward with his 2024 campaign. Today we witness the most evil and heinous abuse of power in the history of our country. Very sad thing to watch. A corrupt sitting president had his top political opponent arrested on fake and fabricated charges of which he and numerous other presidents would be guilty right in the middle of a presidential election. CBS News chief elections and campaign correspondent Robert Costa has more. Former President Donald Trump made his way to the arraignment this afternoon, waving to the supporters who lined the route and passing a spectacle of onlookers, protesters and police gathered outside the Miami federal courthouse. Once inside, the former president, along with aide Walt Nauta, who was also charged in the case, surrendered to authorities, got swabbed for DNA, and were fingerprinted. There was no mugshot taken, and Trump was allowed to hold on to his passport. During the court proceeding, closed to the camera, Trump was expressionless, his hands folded, as his lawyer entered a plea of not guilty to all 37 charges. The former president emerged defiant, making a stop at a Cuban restaurant where supporters were waiting. I think it's going great. I think it's a rigged deal here. We have a rigged country. We have a country that's corrupt. We but Trump now faces serious charges, including illegally hoarding classified documents at his Florida estate that could lead to two decades in prison. According to the indictment, the highly sensitive materials, which included information about the U.S. nuclear program and the military activities of adversaries, were found throughout Mar-a-Lago, in a bathroom, in the lake room, in the white and gold ballroom, and in a storage area, all sitting unsecured while the club held more than 100 social events with outside guests. Trump remains the clear frontrunner for the Republican nomination, and many of his rivals have sided with the former president in blaming what he calls a politicized Department of Justice. Former New Jersey Governor Chris Christie said his fellow candidates are missing the point. And we're in a situation where there are people in my own party who are blaming DOJ. How about blame him? He did it. Former House Speaker Paul Ryan said Republicans will suffer if they stick with Trump. I'm not a Trump fan. Uh, I want to win. And if we nominate Trump, we're going to lose. Uh, he hasn't won anything since 2016. I think we want a nominee who's not weighed down with so much baggage in order to win this election. And it's really clear a lot of our suburban voters will not vote for Donald Trump. And Bob Costa joins me now in this balmy Miami. So, Bob, um, a week is a lifetime in politics. We know that. But you've been reporting that basically the other Republican candidates are waiting for another shoe to drop with Donald Trump. But what happens if this shoe, the shoe in Fulton County and the next one on January 6th investigation, what if those shoes just make the electorate in the Republican Party gather around him more tightly? To carry on this uh this analogy, I would say there are two different tiers of shoe watchers yeah. or shoe throwers. They're looking at this. If you're on the lower tier in terms of polling and fundraising and you're saying, I got to take this shoe and I got to throw it. I got to take my shot. Christie, former Vice President Mike Pence, questioning Trump's respect for the rule of law, the Constitution. They're seeing a bit of a crack here when it comes to a political opening. What I'm closely watching is when does Florida Governor Ron DeSantis, if ever, really start to take on Trump because he senses a soft underbelly politically. When you hear former President Trump talk about this, he says, as he's done so often, he turns attacks on him into an attack on his audience. That sense of grievance fits really nicely with what he is so patterned with saying to the electorate. Is there any message better than grievance for the Republican electorate as it stands right now? For the Republican electorate, right. So when I'm talking to sources close to Trump, they say, right now, this is helpful. It could maybe even consolidate his support across the party. They say we share his grievances. But in a general election, there's still a view going back to 2016 in the Trump circle that he won not because he was Donald Trump. He won because he was running against Secretary Clinton. And the more they can start trying to focus on President Biden, should they become 
the presumptive nominee as a campaign next year, the better for them they see politically. But for now, they'll take this attention. Bob Costa. Thanks, Bob. Thank you. And Donald Trump's uh, today in court, his court appearance, it marked the, the first time a former president faces a federal arraignment. Catherine Herridge spoke with one of Donald Trump's lawyers about the specific issues they're attempting to hurdle in that case. And here's a package now from Catherine. This historic prosecution of a former president presents unique legal arguments and challenges. While special counsel Jack Smith has a recording where Trump allegedly admits keeping a classified Pentagon memo on Iran, Trump's legal team insists he had broad powers to declassify and keep sensitive records like that one. Remember, President Trump was the president. He could declassify documents under the Presidential Records Act. But the National Archives disputes that, saying all records must be returned at the end of an administration. Alina Haba, a Trump lawyer and spokesperson, told CBS News the legal team may move quickly to dismiss the case, citing alleged prosecutorial misconduct. And they are ready to fight each of the 37 criminal counts. These are bogus charges made by a politically motivated special prosecutor. Does the former president understand the serious nature of these criminal charges? Of course. Calling the indictment a one-sided story, Trump lawyers are also expected to demand notes from former Trump attorney Evan Corcoran be thrown out of the case. Corcoran's personal notes quote Trump asking, what happens if we don't respond at all or don't play ball with them? That was in response to the government's subpoena demanding the documents be returned. I think that the testimony of Evan Corcoran is something that will be suppressed. For special counsel Jack Smith, he'll be dealing with a jury made up of Florida residents, a state Trump won in 2016 and 2020. And the heart of the case, the retention of classified documents will create obstacles for prosecutors. The government really has to uh, develop a strategy to use the classified documents without making them public. The judge overseeing the case could also present hurdles. Eileen Cannon, a Trump appointee, slowed the FBI's investigation into the documents last summer. Smith will also likely have to deal with repeated attacks from Donald Trump. Deranged Jack Smith, and he's a big Trump hater. And Catherine Herridge joins me now. Catherine, there was something intriguing in, uh, in the activity today uh, that you picked up on, the idea that there may be more witnesses out there than, uh, than we've thought about in terms of the universe of witnesses from what we've seen inside this indictment. Well, that's right, John. Uh, in the arraignment today, they have what's called a discussion about conditions. And in this case, the prosecution and defense, there was an agreement that there would be no travel restrictions for former President Trump. And then the judge said, I have a condition. And the condition is that Donald Trump cannot talk to some of the witnesses. And the Justice Department is going to put forward a list. Then the defense is going to weigh in on the list. And the judge will have the final say. But what that tells me on my two decades of experience is that there are, in fact, significant witnesses out there and evidence that we simply don't know about, that we have not read in this lengthy indictment, John. Now, one witness, or at least testimony, that they do know about and that they're worried about, that, as uh, the Trump lawyer told you, is they think that they're going to knock out this testimony from President Trump's former lawyer, Evan Corcoran. Why do they think they can do that? You know, the simple answer, John, is not a legal answer. It just all comes down to geography. Now that the charges have been brought here in Florida, it's like wiping the slate clean. Just because this judge in Washington, D.C. agreed that they thought there was a crime committed here in these conversations with the former president and his lawyer, Evan Corcoran, and that the notes, which is extraordinary and unusual, the notes would get into evidence, judge here could say, you know what, I've looked at this. I don't agree. We're knocking those notes out of the box. So it all comes down to this question of geography. And as you know, they had to bring the case here because the alleged crimes were committed at Mar-a-Lago, not in Washington, D.C., where the special prosecutor would have a more favorable jury pool, John. Catherine Herridge. Thanks a million, Catherine.
And now I am joined by Ed O'Keefe from Washington, D.C. Uh, Ed, I'm kind of envious of the um, studio you're in, but um, <laughs> let, me, let me ask you this question. <laughs> Many of uh, President Trump's ally, uh, excuse me, his opponents rushed to his defense was when he was indicted in Manhattan uh, back in April. They called it a politically motivated move. Now, a lot of the party has done that, but there have been some fibrillations since in this last indictment. How do you read the different kinds of reactions? I, I, well, first of all, I'm glad you've shed to the, just the shirt sleeves because uh, it, it looks awfully hot down there, but um, good to be with you. Look, the, I, I think what was the difference here, of course, is national security. I was most struck by what Nikki Haley, one of his opponents, said on Monday, pointing out that her own husband is deploying with the South Carolina National Guard to Africa in the coming days. And pointing out that much of the information he was allegedly holding at Mar-a-Lago is the kind of information that could put troops like her husband at risk. That seems to be a pretty basic argument against his behavior here, and one that she's now wagering probably resonates with a lot of military veterans uh, and others who are concerned about national security and traditionally vote Republican. We have, of course, Chris Christie and Asa Hutchinson, these other contenders out there who are totally about uh, making sure that he doesn't uh, win the nomination again. But the wavering we're now seeing among Haley, Tim Scott, a few others who maybe still have issues with the process and the prosecutors, but acknowledge that the content of the allegations is serious, is something different. And I think we'll, we may see more of it from, from some of the others, just given the fact that this has earned such widespread attention and, uh, and the charges are so serious. So we, what we hear from uh, a number of Republicans rushing to the president's, de, former president's defense is, what about the Bidens? Well, Joe Biden, that's easy. There's a special counsel looking into the classified documents he has. Is there any update on that? And then Hunter Biden uh, is obviously a, a, a great concern to many Republicans. What's the nature or status of the, the House investigation and, the, and the, the other investigations into Hunter Biden? Sure, and they are separate matters, even though Republicans like to talk about them as if they're one big one regarding the family. There's the classified document situation with the president and the documents that were found at his Wilmington home and at his office here in Washington. That investigation continues. No update on when we might learn more. The White House uh, obviously prepared to address it when and if it comes, but they have no update, they told me today, on the timeline there. The Hunter Biden situation is regarding his own uh, issued failing to pay taxes, a potential gun possession charge. It's been investigated by a Trump-appointed federal prosecutor for Wilmington, Delaware. Uh, that investigation also uh, is believed to be continuing, but every so often we get rumblings that there may be some kind of resolution coming. We'll see. But both of those remain out there as potential political and legal issues, both for the president and for his son. Republicans will see them as one and the same. They are, however, very different legal matters. Indeed. Ed O'Keefe from Washington. Thanks a lot, Ed. And this reminder, former President Trump will hold a news conference in the next hour. He'll be speaking from Bedminster, New Jersey. We'll be listening to that and following it, and we'll bring you anything newsworthy that he might say. Inflation has slowed to its slowest pace in two years. But is that enough for the Federal Reserve to keep interest rates where they are? We'll take a closer look and ask an expert to read the tea leaves. And celebrations in Denver over the Nuggets championship were, were marred by violence. We'll have the details. You're streaming CBS News Primetime. The country's justice system is being tested with a challenge it's, it, it's never faced before. A former president of the United States is charged with 37 federal criminal counts, and prosecutors say the accusations against Donald Trump relating to classified documents deal with issues of national security. CBS News legal contributor Jessica Levinson joins me now. Jessica, a condition of Trump's release and actions going forward is that he cannot speak to any potential witnesses about the case, and the Department of Justice is asked to submit that list to court. Is that normal? Well, nothing about this is normal in one sense, but I think it's normal given what we've seen in this case, given who the former president is and that there have been previous accusations of him 
entering into a conspiracy with others to obstruct justice, that there could be other witnesses that we don't know about. So given reading the tea leaves, yes, I think it's normal that a federal judge would say, part of this is don't speak to other people about this case. And that includes uh, his co-conspirator in this case, who we saw the former president with right after the hearing this morning, right after the arraignment. It's You can talk about work, but don't talk about the case. Yeah, and how do you how do you go about enforcing that if you're the the judge? I guess it would be up to the judge to enforce this. Um, how does that get enforced? Since it basically relies on the two of them to um, follow this rule uh, to engage in a trust exercise. So talk about an administrative nightmare of trying to enforce something like this. I mean, what you are relying on in terms of the judge is your faith that people will adhere to these federal rules. And the other thing you're relying on is somebody saying, you know what, I heard these two witnesses talking and you said they shouldn't have. Judge, I'm coming to you and I'm alerting you to something. Um, again, this is not typical, but given what we know about the case, I think it makes all the sense in the world. Speaking of things that aren't typical is that the judge overseeing uh, this case is Eileen Cannon, who was appointed by then President Trump in 2020. She then issued a ruling that was seen as favorable to, to him. And then uh, there was an appellate court that overruled her. What difference could she make in a case? And, and how often do appellate courts overrule a judge in, with, with the kind of critical way in which they did that? I'll answer the last part first, which is that's very rare. And this was a resounding smackdown of Judge Cannon's ruling. As we remember in an earlier iteration of this case, former President Trump had asked for a special master to review documents, there frankly was no legal basis for that request, but she granted the request. That was then appealed up to the conservative 11th Circuit and a three-judge panel, including, I believe, two judges who were appointed by the former president, said to Judge Cannon, there's no basis in the law for this decision, and it really was quite an aggressive legal smackdown. Now, how much control can she have? How much power does she have? A lot. It's everything from scheduling, which, John, as you know, is going to play a huge role because we're not just looking at a court calendar. We're looking at the electoral calendar as well to what evidence will be included. A big thing to look at, will that evidence from Trump's former attorney that we've seen in the indictment, will that be admitted into evidence? And she can also rule on a motion to dismiss the entire case, which depending on when that motion is brought and if it's granted, would not be reviewable by the 11th Circuit. She has an enormous amount of discretion, as does every federal judge. Wait, why wouldn't it be, uh, sorry, just that last bit is, uh, so it's not appealable? So there's something called the Federal Rules of Civil Procedure, excuse me, of Criminal Procedure Rule 29A. And if you bring a Rule 29A uh, motion as the defense and you say there's not enough evidence for the jury to continue to deliberate, and that is brought after the jury has been impaneled, after the prosecution has rested its case, and the judge grants it, that grant is not reviewable because double jeopardy has attached. Well, fascinating. You've taken us well down the road, for which we are grateful. Uh, Jessica Levinson, thank you so much for being with us. Thank you. Inflation for the month of May fell to 4% over a 12-month period, the lowest level in more than two years. That's according to data released Tuesday by the Labor Department. From April to May, food and shelter prices barely budged, increasing less than a percentage point each. Used car prices rose more than 4% in the same time period, and energy prices fell 3.6%. The slowdown in consumer prices comes as the Federal Reserve meets to weigh whether or not to raise interest rates again in the inflation fight. Joining me now to discuss these numbers is David Wessel. He's director of the Hutchins Center on Fiscal and Monetary Policy at the Brookings Institution. So, David, what stood out to you in today's report? 
Well, it seems to me that inflation is no longer a crisis, but it's still a problem. For ordinary consumers, the fact that prices rose only one-tenth of a percentage point in May, 4% over the last 12 months, as you suggested, that's good news and much better than the news we've seen in, in the recent months. But underlying that, there's still inflation is still kind of stubborn, and that's a concern uh, to everybody who has to worry about the future, consumers and the Federal Reserve. And is inflation stubborn in a way that uh, Jerome Powell might be, you know, in a particular way that for him would be would be telling? I know he's been worried about wages. Um, what what inside that number would would potentially be uh, um, noticeable for the Fed as they think about rates going forward? Well, um, as you mentioned, used car prices are up a lot for the last couple of months. They were down some time before that. Egg prices, which soared, are down some, although they're still much higher than they were before the pandemic. What uh, Jerome Powell, the Fed chair, wants to do is look beyond these very volatile things and say, what's the underlying pace of inflation? He has his own particular measure, which is called super core, which excludes certain things. And that's still too strong. So I think what Jay Powell is saying, I'm glad we've made some progress against inflation, but it's not improving quickly enough for me to meet my 2% inflation target in the near term. Right. Uh, I do expect the Fed to, as the word is, skip a rate increase this week, but I think they're going to signal that more rate increases are ahead. And what's your view these days, David, about uh, a, a recession, um, or does this inflation number suggest perhaps the chances of a soft landing are, are more possible, inflation plus the employment picture? Right. Well, as you point out, the jobs market is incredibly strong and continues to surprise us. Uh, and demand in the economy is not anywhere near what you'd expect if we were in a recession now. The concern is that things are just about to soften, that people have spent the money they saved during the pandemic when they couldn't go shopping or take travel, and that the full impact of the Fed's increases in interest rates, which have been remarkably rapid, uh, five percentage points in a year have yet to fully take its toll. We could have some damage from the banking system lying ahead. Banks may be reluctant to lend because we've had some problems there. And it looks like student loan payments are going to have to resume in the fall. That'll take some consumer demand. The recession has been predicted, but it refuses to show up. Uh, most of the forecasters who expected a recession still expect one. They just said it's going to be later. And I'm in that camp. I think the Fed will raise interest rates until the labor market gives, until unemployment goes up, because that's what they think has to happen to bring inflation down to their target. And I think that means a recession end of this year or early next. But I'm not very confident of that forecast. All right, well, we'll check back in with you again. David Wessel, director of the Hutchins Center on Fiscal and Monetary Policy at the Brookings Institution. Thanks a lot, David. You're welcome. Coming up, we'll, we'll go back to the indictment of former President Trump and look at how this case might be considered in the light of history and how it could change the way we think about the presidency. You're streaming CBS News Primetime. Welcome back to CBS News Primetime. I'm John Dickerson. Here's a look at our top stories. NATO Secretary General Jan Stoltenberg Met with President Biden at the White House Tuesday, Stoltenberg thanked the U.S. for its support for Ukraine, saying Ukrainians are making progress in their counteroffensive against Russia. Leaders will gather at the NATO summit in Lithuania next month. Another U.S. military base has changed its name to remove its connection to Confederate leaders. Louisiana's Fort Polk is now Fort Johnson, named after a World War I Medal of Honor recipient. The change comes less than two weeks after North Carolina's Fort Bragg became Fort Liberty. Former President Trump has pleaded not guilty to 37 felony counts stemming from his handling of classified documents. Both pro-Trump and anti-Trump protesters gathered outside the Miami courthouse Tuesday. After his arraignment, President Trump, former President Trump flew to New Jersey to speak to supporters and fundraise. For more on the historical impact of Tuesday's arraignment, let's bring in presidential historian and New York Times bestselling author Alexis Koh. 
Alexis, your book on George Washington rightly poked fun at the myths of George Washington. So keeping that firmly in mind, he and the fellas were sweating it out 236 years ago at the Constitutional Convention where they thought about the presidency and the virtue of the office. What was their conception of the presidency with respect to the character of its occupant? Well, they were looking at the man they intended to set a lot of those precedents. Uh, George Washington presided over the Constitutional Convention, and they figured out quite a lot in the Constitution, but not everything. Even he, who was, you know, present, wasn't quite sure. He, I love his copy of the Constitution because he annotated it. He wrote, President, okay, I'll figure the rest out. For example, the cabinet was his own invention. And they believed that certain precedents that would be set by Washington, who they trusted because he had done something that was truly unprecedented, which was give up power in a time when the world was ruled by monarchs and dictators. They understood that he could control himself, and um, they thought that people would continue to follow his legacy. And that was true with certain exceptions. That's why we have term limits and many other things that we might need in the future. Right, so the character of the occupant would control those ambitions uh, that had uh, sundered other democracies. So what do you think the requirements are now for the job that uh, former President Washington kicked off? Well, what's interesting is we talked about the Constitution, but I think we should look at Washington's farewell address, which is a strikingly modern um, document. It's one that I never imagined I would revisit so many times, but I do so many times per week because he almost predicted what uh, was happening. And I'm not saying that the founders were all knowing people. Thomas Jefferson thought that we should rewrite the Constitution every 19 years. But Washington was very concerned about partisanship. And he was worried that um, a desire for power and to control the nation would, uh, well, trump uh, the the interests of voters and, and the principles that we espouse in our Constitution and we hope to bring to the rest of the world. And he was afraid in particular, and these are his words, that unprincipled men would allow their um, selves to be corrupted in order to maintain power. And I think that's really what's important here. Today, we heard a lot about how Trump is being, you know, wrongly um, accused and how he's being held out as an example, but we didn't hear some important words like, he's innocent. Right. And, and sorry, just to pick, <laughs> to, to, to get very textual, um, when you use the word men there, did you mean the singular or that in the sense of party, that it would create this condition where the rallying instinct of the club would essentially trump everything else, to use the word again? Well, it's so funny. So, Men, he used as a plural. So he said that unprincipled men would try to amass power around someone. And he said it was only a matter of time before a despot would come along and abuse that. And then the American experiment would be over. Um, and we've seen so many moments in which Washington's precedents have been violated, such as the peaceful transfer of power that was never codified because it never needed to be. I think that what you're pointing out is a really significant point here. Um, there were some Republicans, to be fair, today who did say that Trump, you know, had uh, been wrong. And they had, in, in recent days, too, Mitt Romney said he could have just given back the documents. And as far as I know, you know, the, the floor, the, the, the ground did not open underneath them and they didn't fall into, you know, uh, decay. And so I think that it's important to remember here that we are um, Americans first and then whatever political party we decide upon. But that should also be flexible. If we don't like parties, we should be able to leave them. That's what Theodore Roosevelt did. He created his own. Not saying that was a good one, but it's an option. Yeah, <laughs> it's an option. So as, as a la last question, Alexis, um, do you see, it, it, after the last election, when former President Trump lied to stay in office and it set off a series of challenges inside his Justice Department, inside the Senate, um, in the individual states, the courts, the system held in the end, but it was tested. Do you see this moment as a kind of round two of that as the legal process happens, but then you see the political, those factions you were talking about with, with uh, President Washington um, take hold of this court case in, in the, uh, 
public conversation? I think that we shouldn't assume or take for granted our democracy, our republic, and we should not suggest that it's resilient. We can say that it's held, but we're still waiting for accountability. And I think something that's really important about the presidency, a fair amount of distrust was established after President Ford pardoned Nixon. And he did so explicitly because Nixon was going to be held accountable for crimes against the United States. So what we should be focusing on here is not whether justice is, should be applied, but whether why it shouldn't be that we need there to be a rule of law in order for our democracy to continue to exist and thrive and aspire towards a better country. That is what the founders wanted for us, to make our country better with every generation. And that means making sure to respond to any threats, whether they be inside the United States or outside of it. Alexis Ko, thank you so much for being with us. Thank you. And we will have more coverage of former President Trump's arraignment Wednesday morning. My colleagues Anne-Marie Green and Vlad Dutier will have reaction from the day's events and show us what comes next. Transportation Secretary Pete Buttigieg has vowed to help repair the destroyed section of Interstate 95 in Philadelphia as quickly as possible. Buttigieg toured the collapsed site on Tuesday. A section of the key highway gave way Sunday when a tanker truck caught fire underneath it. The Transportation Secretary promised federal assistance to fix the roadway. We're going to continue to be here every step of the way for as long as it takes with both financial backing and any other technical support that's needed. I-95 will remain closed in both directions as repairs are made, which could take weeks to complete. The body was recovered from the wreckage Monday. Family have identified the person as Nathan Moody. A drug deal gone wrong, that's what police say, likely led to a shooting in downtown Denver as basketball fans celebrated the Nuggets NBA championship win. Ten people were wounded by gunfire near Ball Arena early Tuesday morning, a few hours after game five of the NBA finals. All of them are expected to survive. Their injuries, police say, about five or six of those people were innocent bystanders not involved in the alleged, alleged drug deal. Police say two men were arrested in connection with the shooting. We're tracking some severe storms gathering over the southeast, bringing possible tornadoes or hail. For more details, here's meteorologist Chris Bruin from the Weather Channel. Severe weather really going to top our list of stories here for the middle part of the week and in an area you wouldn't necessarily expect this time of the year, especially for organized severe weather. Yeah, we get thunderstorms, but this is going to be more than your typical summertime thunderstorm event. Widespread heavy thunderstorms that are going to produce damaging winds and the potential here for large hail and even tornadoes for the southeast, Mississippi, Alabama, Georgia, northern Florida. There's round number one coming through the first half of your Wednesday and then the more concerning round these cells coming out of Mississippi, moving through Alabama very quickly, and then pushing through the I-75 corridor, even impacting the Atlanta Metro down through Macon and even Albany, Georgia, as we head through the late night hours on Wednesday. This thing continues overnight Wednesday night, and that concerns us for flash flooding. There will be rain farther north, but not enough to cause too many concerns aside from below average temperatures. And speaking of temperatures, how about the extreme heat here in Texas? We're talking dangerous levels with heat index values up near 110 and higher. Well, for more in-depth coverage, be sure to watch the Weather Channel on cable and now live on your favorite TV streaming device. A new investigation found that over $400 billion of COVID-19 relief money was stolen or wasted. We'll speak to one of the reporters who tracked this story to find out how fraudsters were able to do this. You're streaming CBS News Primetime. At a time when America was grappling with overcrowded hospitals, school closures, and shuttered businesses, thousands of fraudsters were swindling the federal government out of billions of dollars in COVID-19 relief funds. That's according to an Associated Press investigation. Its analysis found that more than $280 billion in emergency funding was potentially stolen. Another $123 billion was wasted or misspent. 
The AP says the total loss amounts to 10 percent of the $4.2 trillion the U.S. government has dispersed in COVID relief aid. For more on this, I am joined by Richard Lardner. He's one of the reporters who helped conduct this investigation. Richard, in the article, you write how, quote, the grift was just way too easy. I mean, there were cases where money was paid out to names like John Doe. Uh, why was it so easy to do that? Speed was the priority early on. The, the, the goal was to get money out the door very, very quickly. This was um, an almost unprecedented national emergency. Um, and decisions were made that getting money to people fast uh, was was the priority over making sure it went to the right people or not to people who were trying to steal it. And, and could anything have been done different? Was there a small fix that could have been made to avoid this unprecedented yeah. amount of fraud or, or if, go ahead. Sure. Uh, sorry. We, um, uh, Michael Horowitz, who is the uh, chairman of the pandemic, the Federal Pandemic Response Accountability Committee, also the Department of uh, Justice Inspector General, um, has said there is a Treasury Department database called Do Not Pay that will, if you run a name through it, uh, you may find somebody is a convicted felon uh, or a debarred contractor uh, or somebody who should not get federal money. They did not do that early on. Um, and Horowitz has said it, it wouldn't have taken that long. Um, th there was this choice between speed and then thinking if you used things like do not pay, that would take, you know, weeks or just way too long. And they wouldn't be able to help people so quickly. But he disagrees with that. And so what's the, what, what are the consequences for the, uh, the people who stole this money? Um, that is still being accounted for. I think that's one of the interesting parts of this is um, uh, there have been, Justice Department has told us uh, more than 2,200 defendants charged so far. Uh, there are thousands of investigations underway. Um, Congress last year approved and President Biden signed uh, an increase on the statute of limitations for uh, SBA, Small Business Administration uh, program crimes from five to 10 years. And there's a push to make unemployment insurance fraud, which was another huge source of fraud in pandemic relief from five to 10 years. So federal investigators, prosecutors, inspector generals are going to be busy with this for quite a long time. And Richard, help me sort through isn't there a bunch of money that's um, that's still yet to be paid out uh, from the tranches of money that were rushed yeah. out the door to uh, address COVID-19? Yeah, yeah, there's still money that not every dollar was spent immediately. There's money that, you know, went uh, uh, to other places that has a longer uh, lead time uh, in order to spend it. So the accounting is still being done. Uh, but. Congress allocated and uh, administrations approved over $5.2 trillion, perhaps a little bit more. Uh, but the actual amount spent, according again to that pandemic response about accountability committee, is about $4.2 trillion to date. And those numbers will be updated, but, but that's, that's their current accounting. All right, Richard Lardner, investigative reporter for the Associated Press. Thank you so much, Richard. Thank you. Former President Trump says he won't drop out of the 2024 race for president, despite the federal charges against him. But what do the charges mean for voters as he asks them to send him back to the White House? We'll think about that question in an essay. You're streaming CBS News Primetime. We've talked a lot about artificial intelligence on this show, the dangers and the possibilities, and how it has the potential to completely reshape our world. Well, here's something else that we're learning that artificial intelligence can do. Bring the Beatles back together. Paul McCartney on Tuesday revealed that technology has been used to create what he calls the final Beatles record. 
by extracting John Lennon's voice from a recording he made before he died in 1980. McCartney, who has used artificial intelligence to sing with Lennon on his recent tour, says the song will be released later this year. America's most exciting night in music will look a bit different next year. The Recording Academy announced Tuesday that the 2024 Grammys will include three new categories. They are Best Pop Dance Recording, Best Amer African Music Performance, and Best Alternative Jazz Album. Additionally, the categories of Producer of the Year, Non-Classical, and Songwriter of the Year, Non-Classical, will be moved into the general field. This means that all Grammy voters will now be able to participate in selecting the winners. Jury selection has not started for the trial Donald Trump will face after his arraignment on Tuesday, but jurors in the court of public opinion have already been chosen. They're the voters. For them, the indictment and the president's responses to what's contained in it offer something we never get, a pre get to see during a presidential campaign, a chance to look at how a candidate handles the most sensitive material in American national security and whether he meets the standards of character that such a responsibility demands. The indictment also offers a window into a series of other aspects of the job, how the Republican frontrunner responds when faced with conflict between an obligation of law and custom and his self-preservation, how he behaves when he thinks nobody's looking, what he asks his aides to do on his behalf. The trial will determine whether the acts alleged in the indictment meet the test for conviction. But in the court of public opinion, where the president testifies by the hour, he is asking more than to be exonerated. He is asking voters to find his conduct with this material so exemplary that he should be rewarded with four more years in office. Up next, our continuing coverage of Donald Trump's arraignment for all of us here at CBS News Primetime. I'm John Dickerson. That's our report. Thank you for spending the hour with us.